so let me say more about the Vexelian approach. And this is the sort of quadrant in the circular flow that I didn't have time to go into last time. I sort of skipped over it. That is the quadrant where funds of savers meet the demands for funds from investors and other borrowers, uh, namely governments. Uh, and there's an equilibrium interest rate that uh, clears that market. So on the demand curve, we've got right, so it's the demand for funds that are available for borrowing. Uh, this is not just what goes on at bank loan offices, but throughout the financial system. Right? People who are selling bonds are borrowing funds. Uh, firms that are selling new shares of stock in an IPO, they're demanding loanable funds. It's not a typical loan, it's an equity investment, but it's getting funds today in exchange for the promise of returning the funds in the future. Uh, so all that stuff is on the demand curve for loanable funds, primarily business firms with investments and governments with deficits. Uh, and of course, that's been a bigger and bigger share of the demand in recent years. On the supply curve, we have the suppliers of loanable funds, which have traditionally been households. Some households borrow, but on net, the household sector is supplying loanable funds, mostly because people are saving, saving for their retirement. That's the biggest motive people have for saving. The other is saving for kids' college education. Uh, Right, but people are saving basically in order to smooth their lifetime consumption. You want to have something left when you retire. <laughs> uh, you don't want to rely on Social Security. <laughs> uh, but fortunately, opinion polls tell us that most people your age know that they can't rely on Social Security. So good, I hope you've got a savings plan going. Uh, but another source of supply of loanable funds is foreign savers. Uh, and that includes foreign households, but also, in the case of China, uh, foreign governments. Right? So they could be supplying loanable funds to the US market by buying our bonds. And then, oh, as it's usual with supply and demand curves, uh, we look for the intersection point, because that's the point at which the quantity people want to demand, being shown on the demand curve for each given interest rate, uh, coincides with the quantity people want to supply, which is shown on the supply curve, which is an increasing uh, function of the interest rate in the market. So at that it market clearing rate, uh, everybody who wants to borrow can borrow at that rate, and everybody who wants to lend at that rate can find a borrower. Right? Uh, if the rate were above that, it would be pushed down by frustrated lenders cutting their prices. And if it were below that, it would be raised by frustrated borrowers bidding up what they were willing to pay, or what they were offering. Uh, so in equilibrium, we got equality between quantity demanded and supplied. Uh, it's important to distinguish between the interest rate you see reported in the newspaper, the money interest rate, or the nominal interest rate, uh, and the real interest rate, which is what you get after we take out inflation. Um, and the, the real interest rate depends on sort of the underlying preferences that savers have for consuming now versus later, and the rates of return that borrowers anticipate on their projects, and so how eagerly, what rates they're going to be willing to pay to finance those projects. Uh, and those sort of fundamental underlying things are not affected by monetary policy. Those are real underlying factors. But what policy affects is how much in, uh, inflation people anticipate. And if you anticipate more inflation and you're a lender, you're going to demand a higher money interest rate to compensate you for the fact that when you get paid back, the dollars don't buy as much. Uh, so we call that the inflationary premium in interest rates. And right now, of course, at the short end, inflation rate uh, is pretty low. Oh, sorry, the, the nominal interest rate is less than 1%. Uh, now, nobody expects less than 1% inflation, so we're in an unusual period in which the real interest rate at the short end is uh, negative. If you want a real return, you've got to lend your money out 10, 20, 30 years, which causes, is having uh, kind of peculiar effects and making life very difficult for pension managers. Might mention that. So 
let's get back to how this figures into business cycles. If investors become more optimistic about investment opportunities, about earning real returns, then they'll increase the quantity of funds they want to borrow at any given interest rate. So when 2%, initially 2% was the equilibrium rate, but if demanders of loanable funds are more eager, uh, that rate will no longer clear the market. There would be an excess demand at 2%. So that's going to put upward pressure on the interest rate. And in the example, it rises to 3%. So R2, that's what's clearing the market now that demand has expanded. And, and at that higher interest rate, once again, plans of savers mesh with plans of investors. Uh, there are enough savings to finance the projects that people want to undertake at, at the market interest rate. Uh, right, so you get a movement along the supply curve, so there's an increase in the quantity supplied, and there's more real intermediation, more borrowing and lending in real terms. Uh, and the economy will be you know, forming capital in order to earn the returns to pay to the savers. So that's all fine and dandy. But suppose the central bank jumps in, and we'll talk in two weeks about how the central bank would actually do this, what the mechanics are of it. But Suppose they can expand the money supply in order to provide enough funds to satisfy all the demands at 2%. So they pad the supply of real household savings with uh, just money produced at the stroke of a keyboard. Uh, the Fed goes out and purchases enough bonds right, to free up funds, make more funds available. Uh, to the banking system, and the banking system expands its lending. Uh, at the old interest rate uh, of 2%, we now have a, a kind of market clearing, but it's a market clearing in which investment is exceeding actual desired saving. The excess of that investment is being funded by the creation of new money. And that's setting up, uh, the, right, so this is the Vexelian slash Austrian uh, perspective on it. That's setting up the, the economy for a boom, but which isn't going to last because the plans of savers and investors aren't fundamentally meshing. Uh, the economy is, in a sense, biting off more than it can chew. Uh, and it, it's going to have trouble swallowing. Uh, people are going to initiate investment plans that savers don't really want to finance. Uh, they can only be apparently financed as long as the Fed uh, accommodates them at the old interest rate. Right, so this is the Hayek's diagnosis of what happened in the 20s. The Fed held interest rates too low. And there are lots of uh, historical reasons why the Fed would have done that. One was that Great Britain was trying to get back on the gold standard. But gold was flowing into the US from Great Britain. So to help Great Britain out, the Fed wanted interest rates low so that they would stop attracting funds from Britain. Returns would be low in the US, and that would stop gold from flowing to the US. Uh, but the other thing that was happening, of course, was there were real investment demands in the 20s. There was that shift out in demand for loanable funds. There were lots of new technologies, like electrification, uh, luring people into uh, sort of creating investment opportunities. Uh, which if they had raised, if the interest rate had risen, then only the most promising opportunities, investments would have been financed. But now everybody could get financed. So there's an overcommitment of funds uh, to investment. And that leads to the crisis. And if you look at the industries that are most interest sensitive, like housing, like heavy industry, right, because the payback periods are so long, 20, 30 years, that if you lower the interest rate, it really increases the present value of those future payoffs. But if that interest rate can't stay that low, because it's artificially low, then those projects that are initiated are going to turn out not to be profitable. And at some point, they get abandoned. Uh, and that's the crisis. This uh, theory is kind of like, I mean, one analogy that's been popular for it is that everything feels good when you're having a drinking binge. Uh, I believe that on college campuses today, uh, it's called a binge if you start your second beer. That, is that right? <laughs> uh, the standards have fallen. But anyway, uh, 
everything feels fine, but the next morning you get a hangover uh, because you kind of borrowed against your future whatever. Uh, and it, now Krugman uh, thinks that this is kind of a funny analogy, and he sort of ridicules it as the uh, hangover theory of, of recession. But it's actually not a bad metaphor. And, and I don't know if some of you remember this. Uh, uh, former President Bush, when, when he was still in office, uh, was meeting with some supporters, I think it was, and he asked everybody in the room to turn off your cell phones. And now I'm going to tell you why there was a crash in 2008. He says, well, Wall Street got drunk and now it has a hangover. <laughs> of course, not everybody turned off their cell phones, so this got out. Uh, so the problem in this diagnosis is that Funds have been committed to the wrong kinds of investment because the interest rate's been distorted. And in particular, investments with long payback periods are artificially enhanced in attractiveness. And in the 1920s, it was things like pig iron. <coughs> and in the 1990s, of course, it was housing. Uh, it's not that houses take so long to build. But of course, the services they deliver last many years. And homeowners are the ones who borrow to do the financing. And at low interest rates, people buy bigger houses and second houses. And that was certainly going on. Uh, so and of course, we had a whole raft of policies to encourage home ownership, which were putting more and more people into uh, homes. Uh, but more homes were being built than could conceivably be occupied. Uh, and so that had to come to an end. Uh, so these were mistaken investments. And it, it's improved around Las Vegas in uh, the last couple of years. But oh, back around 2009, 2010, if you flew in at the right angle, you could look out the window and see these sort of abandoned condominium projects, like whole neighborhoods where they had laid their streets and then never built the condos, or had started the foundations and then never finished them. So. Projects were abandoned when it became clear that the demand wasn't there. Uh, interest rates had gone back up. People weren't going to buy these at those prices. Uh, now, a popular here, I'm, I'm kind of steering into monetary policy, so I'll be brief here. Uh, one view is that if we had just kept the price level stable, if we just keep the price level stable, we can avoid big swings in the economy. But in the 20s, we actually did keep the price level stable. The consumer price index hardly budged. Uh, and Hayek's explanation was, look, that's not the issue. The issue is whether you're distorting the investment market. Right? It's a savings and investment story. And his view is that to keep the price level from falling in a period of dramatic real growth and you know, pretty much flat money growth, because we're on a gold standard, they had to pump in a lot of credit. Uh, and even though it didn't raise prices, it misdirected production by keeping interest rates artificially low. Uh, so if that makes any sense to you, then you, you see it again uh, in the 2000s when the Fed famously kept interest rates too low too long following the dot-com crash. And it has to make you worry about right now when we've had zero interest rate policy for five years. So what should you do instead? You should let the interest rate rise when the demand for loanable funds increases. That's Hayekian policy. The Fed policy in the 20s was to shift out the supply of loanable funds by increasing uh, money supply and keep the interest rate from rising, uh, which creates a problem. 